when they come to me. And so um, let's have this be interactive. I definitely don't want to just talk at all of you for an hour. So please feel free, uh, jump in, interrupt questions, comments. I'm going to ask some questions. If people could participate, that would be great. So, so some bios here, which I will skip through. These are a little bit out of order, it looks like, so bear with me a second. Okay, so we're going to start with joint venture. So um, just a show of hands, how many of you would like to develop real property someday? Okay, got a few. So uh, of those that raise their hands, how many have $100 million in the bank that they can just plop down and do that? Okay. Exactly zero. Maybe there's one person out here that's lucky. I don't know. So I'm guessing this is probably truthful. Nobody here has the money to actually develop real estate. So that's where a joint venture comes in. Uh, so let's just kick it off. What What is a joint venture? Does anybody have, have a guess or an understanding? Go ahead. It's when a pool of investors come together um, for one singular project so that they can all do their money and buy a bigger investment. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, the way you can think of a joint venture is it's, it's any time one or more people come together for some common purpose. And it could be for, you know, one project. It could be for multiple projects. And so when you're out there sourcing deals, it's good to understand it ahead of time. Are you going to be joint venturing with somebody for one project or is it going to be multiple projects? So you, you don't want to assume that it'll just be one because sometimes, especially if you have a little bit more experience, I mean, you might be able to find an investor who is interested in having what's called a programmatic joint venture, where you can find a series of properties and do a, a number of projects together. So just to, to back up for a second. So, you know, as, as was mentioned, a joint venture is any time that you have two parties coming together. In the real estate context, that can look... Um, uh, they can they can have a, a number of different looks. That could be a developer who doesn't have much money pairing up with an equity investor who does have a lot of money, and so they can come together for the common purpose of completing a building. There could be, sorry, I've got a pop up here. Um, another type of joint venture would be let's say that you want to buy a property that's already been built. You could have a operating partner. So somebody who has the expertise of owning and operating real estate pair up with the person that has the money to buy it, which is commonly referred to as the equity investor. So there, there's different permutations for, for purposes of this talk today. I'm going to be thinking of this in the, the developer equity investor context. Because a lot of you find a lot of people who graduate out of out of LMU tend to go into sort of development oriented type jobs. Okay, so this joint ventures as a topic is very broad. It's almost impossible to do it justice in 20, 25 minutes. And so what my goal is for you all to hear some key terms, have a general understanding of the most important things that people think about when they're putting together a joint venture. Um, and, you know, it's important to sort of ferret out some very basic business issues at the get-go so that everybody um, is happy moving forward. One of the most important things to think about when you're entering into a joint venture, regardless of whether you're a developer, or an equity investor is who has the right to manage the company. Um, does, does anybody know in a, in a typical development joint venture where you have a developer and an equity investor, who has the right to actually manage the company and make decisions? Well, I think they figured that out in like the PSA, the purchase and sale. So, so the, they would figure out in the joint venture uh, purchase and sales when you already have a joint venture. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, but you're right. They figure it out ahead of time. And it's, it's kind of a trick question because some people say, Oh, well, it's the, it's the person that's running the day to day. 
it, it can be either. It can be either the developer or the equity investor. It depends on the particular relationship, it depends on the negotiating leverage, it depends on how much money people are putting in. So, and to really um, kind of highlight how it depends it is, we have some clients who we, so our, our firm, we primarily represent equity investors. So that's often the, the perspective that I'm thinking from thinking. In. We have a number of equity investor clients who will be putting in 95% of the equity. Like a 95-5 is a pretty common split where the equity investor puts in 95, the developer puts in 5%. Um, we have many clients who do this and the management rights even though it's a similar split of equity, look very different between different clients. So if you are a developer who's out there trying to source deals, you know, often what you'll do is, is you find a deal and you'll approach a broker, or if you develop your own relationships, you'll approach equity investors and um, try, to, try to get money from them. And the terms of that money can look very different, even though it could be the same you know, money you'd be getting from, from somebody else. So um, it's important to know from the get-go how much say are you going to have as the developer? Because when you go to develop a piece of property, there's lots of decisions that have to be made on that are small and also the, that are very large. And so if you are a developer and you're pairing up with an equity investor that you don't know very well, you could be in a situation where somebody you don't know very well, you don't know their expertise, but they happen to have a lot of money to be calling the shots on how you actually build a property. So that that could be bad. Um, then again, if you're, if you're pairing up with an equity investor that is a you know private equity, um, real estate focused platform who does hundreds of deals a year, feel a little bit more comfortable that even though they might call the shots, they're probably gonna be calling pretty good shots because they, they know how to do this pretty well. Um, so that said, are there any topics where both both partners would usually have a say? Anybody want to take a go? That's okay. So let's say there is, um, let's say somebody wants to sell the property. That, that could be pretty substantial, right? Because you have a developer who is um, putting in a lot of time. They're putting in a lot of effort. You have an equity investor who's tied up a lot of money, so there, there's interest in both on on both sides of the venture, with respect to, um, you know, whether you, sh you should actually sell or not, because both people have different interests. Um, so that's often what's referred to as a major decision, and it requires both investors' approval. But that said, I can think of a number of our clients who. Um, they will never agree to that. They, even though they're not running the day to day, they want sole discretion as to whether it's going to be sold. So, again, when you're talking to people um, and getting ready to enter into a joint venture, very early on, you want to understand um, what the, the management structure is going to be like. And so, on the kind of the, the reverse of that is, you no, know, are, are there situations where a partner might not want to have a say over something. You know, we often think of having the right to say yes or no to things as being a good thing. It's not always a good thing because let's say you are a major private equity real estate fund. You have lots of deals. You don't want your developer or your operator coming to you to say, hey, can you approve this little apartment lease? It's $1,500 a month. I mean, if, if you had to do that for every, let's say you build a you know 400 unit multifamily property and then multiply that out by how many different deals you're doing across the country, that would just be a constant stream of these really low level decisions that the whole point of pairing up with somebody is so that they're making those decisions for you. So oftentimes the joint venture agreement will specifically say, you know, the equity investor either doesn't have the right to approve or doesn't have to approve small decisions so make, so long as they're made within some context. So you you could have, for example, sticking with the leasing example, you could have a page 
that's attached to the joint venture agreement that says these are the leasing guidelines. So you can only enter into leases that are for a term of at least nine months, and it has to be rent between here and here, and the person has to have a credit score between here and here. And operator, as long as you lease to people within those parameters, you don't have to come to us for approval. So again, when you're thinking about rights and responsibilities, it's helpful to think, you know, how is the day-to-day -day going to be determined? If I'm the developer or the operating partner, am I going to have to be going to my equity investor every day asking for, for, for permission for little things? I mean, it just might not be efficient. So it's something to keep in mind. Bit of a lag here. Okay. So now let's talk about the money. So the money is obviously really important. Um, you can't build a project or really do anything useful without it. That's just reality. So what, what is a capital contribution? Does anybody know? It's strictly capital. Capital? Your, 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 your contribution is capital, is money. Is money. Are there any other, are there any other types of capital other than money? What's that? Debt. 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 Um, yeah, that could be, that could be a capital contribution. Um, anything else? Land. Land. Yes, land. That's what I was thinking. So oftentimes in a development situation, you would have a, you know, you could, you could be a developer and you could go buy some little parcel of land that's out in the middle of farmland and you've sat on it for 10 years. And at the time it wasn't worth that much, but now stuff's been developing around it. And now you're thinking, oh, this might be a really good opportunity to build some, some multifamily or maybe build a big um, single family home development, something like that. So you can contribute the land into the joint venture and receive credit for that, just like it was cash. Um, one thing that's often negotiated and you wanna raise this early on is well how much credit are you going to get for putting land into the joint venture so let's say that you you spent hundred thousand dollars on a parcel of land 10 years ago and you're now it's 10 years have gone by and you're ready to contribute that to a joint venture you know do, do you get a hundred thousand for it that's how much you spent but there could be a reason to, to get more. That, that land could have increased in value. You could have spent money getting the approvals to develop something often referred to as entitlements. So you could have appreciation, you could have additional costs have gone into it. And so what you, if you're the developer, you wanna tell your equity investor, look, I know I only put $100,000 cash in to buy the property, but I want you to give me capital contribution credit of 400,000. And that's something that investors will agree, equity investors will agree to um, if, if it's appropriate in, in the circumstances. So the moral story there is don't just look at how much money you have sunk into something. Look at what the value is of, of the property that's being contributed. So then that, that brings us to capital calls. So this is a, um, a term that gets more daylight whenever the real estate industry starts running into trouble. So if you ever hear people talking about capital calls, what that means is the joint venture needs more money to do whatever it's supposed to be doing. So if this is a joint venture that is um, constructing new projects, you could need more money because you need to go pay your contractor another $500,000 or $1 million or whatever. If this is a, um, a completed building, Let's say it's an let's say it's an older office building that needs some renovation, in and it's not in the property is not generating enough cash flow to pay for that itself. Then you would need to contact your investors within the joint venture and say, "Hey, we need more money," and you make what's called a capital call. And if a capital call happens, 
the joint venture agreement, it's going to say what happens if the person doesn't put in the money. So usually it's not, it's not like a, um, you know, a, a choice. So you don't think of it as like, oh, someone's making a capital call. I can either choose to say yes or no to this. You might be able to, I mean, you can do whatever you want, whether the other person has some kind of remedy for you not putting in money, that, that's another thing. And the way that most joint venture agreements work is that if someone makes a capital call and you're responsible for putting money into the joint venture and you don't do that, then the other party can put in the money that you were supposed to put in. And so that's, if you ever hear of someone being diluted, that that's what that's referring to because somebody puts in your share of the money and now the out of the total pot of money that's been put in, your proportion of money that, that was yours has now gone down. So your corresponding interest in the venture has also gone down. So that's that's how dilution works. And, and it can go a little bit further than that. And again, this is something you want to figure out at the very early end of your transaction, like at the letter of intent stage. Is it just going to be simple one-to-one -one dilution or is it going to be what's called punitive dilution? Punitive dilution is where let's say you're supposed to put in a dollar and you don't put in the dollar and, and your partner does, they will get a dollar's worth of credit. Punitive dilution could be for every dollar they put in, the they're deemed to put in maybe a dollar fifty or a dollar twenty-five. So it really disincentivizes a person from just ignoring a capital call or not putting the money in because they're going to see their ability to down the road get money out of the venture. They're going to see that diminish as as they get further and further. Okay, so I'm going to speed up a little bit here because, again, we don't have that much time to talk about joint ventures. Um, one thing I did want to touch on that I think is important is the promote. Just by a show of hands, how many people have heard of a promote? Okay, so this is one of the most important things to a developer or if you're an operator, someone who's not the main money partner. What a promote is is it's a right to receive a disproportional distribution of funds from the venture. So let's say sticking with the 95-5 setup, if a, there could be a certain situation based on the waterfall, which I know I skipped over that, but I'll talk about that in a second, that allows the developer to, instead of getting 5% of the distributions of cash and being late, they might be able to get 10% or 20%, even though they only put in 5% of the money. And so the, and the way it works is you have what's called a waterfall. A waterfall is the, um, the order of distributions that are made. So the, how a promote fits into a waterfall is, let's say, um, the... If, when there's cash available for distribution, so the property is operating, it's generating cash, the parties will get distributions in accordance with their with their percentage interest, so 95.5, until let's say the equity investor gets a 15% return on their investment. And then the next level of the waterfall, it might say that instead of 95.5, it'll be 90%, 10%. So now the equity investor is getting more money than they would be entitled to as it, if there wasn't this, this promote. And so what the purpose of the promote is it incentivizes the developer to maximize the profits out of the joint venture. The developer likes it because they're saying, hey, like we're getting more than our fair share because we've worked really hard. And the equity investor likes it because it incentivizes the developer to put in a lot of work and increase the value of the property, make it generate more money. So it's a win-win situation. Um, this is something that if, if you're a developer or you're an operator, regardless of whether this is res, you know, small residential to you know, large resort, you want to understand what your promote's going to look like because that could mean the difference between whether you want to do the deal or not, because you're putting in a lot of effort, you want to know that there's sufficient upside for the amount of effort that you're going to be putting in. 
Okay, so I, I wanted to hit on a couple of um, important covenants. So a covenant is just a, a fancy legal word for promise. So everything that you see in these legal documents, in all aspects of your life, a big portion of those are covenants. It's things that the various parties to the agreement are agreeing to do. And I wanted to touch on just a few of them. Um, a key person covenant is uh, pretty typical in a real estate development joint venture. And essentially what it is, is so long as the property is being built, there needs to be a certain person at the developer. So if that, you know, within that 5% equity who is actively involved with the project, because the idea is this, the equity investor, they have money and the reason why they're even partnering to begin with is because somebody else has time and skill and it's somebody that they, that they trust, at least to some degree. So they want to know that that person is going to be there until the project is completed or maybe even longer. So what you'll see in a joint venture agreement is that at all times, Alex Davis has to be actively putting time into the project. And if you don't do that, which goes to what happens if a partner breaches a covenant, a lot of bad things could happen. Yeah, go ahead. Did you say the key person is in, in addition to the developer or it could be just the developer? It's it's usually a with someone within the developer. So like when I speak of a developer, it's sort of like a development company okay. and there's employees. So this would be like a key person within the employee. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so let's say that we say, let's let's say that I'm the developer and I am also the key person and I stop working on the project or maybe I get fired or something like that. That key person provision has been breached and there's lots of safeguards that, that a savvy developer will put into the documents to make sure that their position is protected. But what could happen if the proper steps aren't taken is they could lose all rights to manage the property they could lose all rights to make capital calls. Um, they could forfeit their promote, which as we talked about, the promote is so important that, I mean, that, that could be catastrophic for their business plan. Um, and so generally speaking, when you when you look at a joint venture agreement, you, you wanna really understand you know, what your rights and obligations are um, for each aspect. And then the, um, one other one is that I wanted to mention is what happens if a proposed partner is not credit worthy? So this is, um, you know, we often think of credit worthiness as, as a big institutional um, lender or investor evaluating the credit of someone who's lesser than them, for lack of a better word. It goes the other way, too. So let's say that I'm a developer and um, someone with a lot of money says, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put up this much of the project. So let's say that the equity again, 95, I'm putting in five. I'm still putting in 5% of whatever. So let's say it's a hundred million dollar project. If I put in $5 million, proportionally it's kind of small, but I don't know about you. Like that's a lot of money for me. Like I, I wouldn't want to lose that. And the way that I'm going to be comfortable that I'm going to be able to build a property and not going to lose my $5 million is that the person has to put in the 95 is actually going to put in their money. The way that some investments are structured is that the 95% party, it might not be like if you, if you hear of like, I'm just going to use Blackstone as an example, because everybody's heard of Blackstone. If Blackstone is going to put in 95% of the money, as, you know, as, as if you're like a developer, you might be thinking, oh, I've got this, you know, multi multi-billion dollar fund that's standing behind their obligation to me to put in the money. But what, what could happen is Blackstone could instead, they could create an entity solely for the purpose of funding this investment. And so if, if things go badly, they may have a reason to, to cut off funding. And your only recourse would be to sue an entity that has no money. So that's, that's not very helpful. So what you always want to be thinking is whenever you're entering into a contract, this really goes for like anything in life, more, more than just real estate development. You want to understand who you're actually entering into a contract with. Are you entering into a contract with a parent company that has billions of dollars? Or are you entering into a contract with 
a company that might be incentivized to just not perform because they think they're judgment proof. And so there's ways to solve for that, which goes beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. But something to keep in mind, you always want to know from the get go, who, who is your counterpart? Okay. So exit rights, you know, people spend a lot of time thinking about how they're going to get into the deal. Most of the time, it's, it's, it's as important, if not more important, than how are you going to get out of the deal? You know, a lot of developers, when they build properties, they're not building them from the, from the perspective of build and hold for the next 30 years or something like that. There's exceptions. Um, but a, a lot of what in, in the market is more of a, of a merchant builder idea where you build a property, you lease it up till it's fully leased, and then you sell it. So the sale is, is your exit. So it's really important to know how are you going to be able to get out of this joint venture. So one way that you can get out is through what's called a forced sale. And so that means that in the joint venture agreement, remember this kind of goes back to what we talked about at the beginning about management rights, forced sale is having the right to sell the property. Um, another way to exit a deal is through a buy-sell. Um, buy sells can get complicated, but the way you can think of it simply is if you have a dispute with your partner and, and you just you want this relationship to end one way or the other, whether you're out or they're out, you can send a letter to them that says, hey, I'm triggering the buy sell. This is how much I think the property is worth. You can choose to either buy me out or let me buy you out. And if you don't make a decision, you're deemed to let me buy you out. And so a buy-sell, the, the key thing to remember here, if you're going to take away one thing about the buy-sell is this, the buy-sell is disproportionately beneficial to the equity investor because you people often use these buy-sells as bluffs. It's kind of like you're playing chicken. And if you are up against somebody with, you know, close to a hundred times more money than you are, they'll actually have the ability to, to execute a transaction buying on the buy sell side. So just something to keep in mind. If you hear people talking about buy sells, you want to understand how that's going to work um, in your joint venture. Okay. So um, yeah, go ahead. How would a developer like bluff the equity investor, if they put in like 95 million, the developer only put in five. So um, it's a good question. So where you can see that come up is, you know, there are developers out there who have a lot of money. So um, for example, one that immediately comes to mind is like Trammell Crow. If people have heard of Trammell Crow. They're, they're a developer, but they have a lot of money um, individually. So they might not want to be 100% of the equity in a project, but they could. And so that's where it comes down to knowing, you know, what are the, the relevant negotiating positions and financial strengths of, of the parties? It's a good question. So we're going to move to um, purchase and sale agreements um, in a minute. I just want to ask if there's any questions before I move on. Don't be shy. Okay. All right. So we're going to, we're going to move to purchase and sale. And then we're going to take about a five minute break after that. So I, I like that we talked about joint ventures first, because before you can buy property, you have to have the money to do it. And you're either going to have the money yourself, which case joint venture may not be relevant, but oftentimes you need a partner. So joint venture. So now let's, let's assume that the joint venture is ready to go. You found a property, you're ready to buy the property with your joint venture partner. Um, what you're going to have to do is enter into a purchase and sale agreement. That is the legal document that allows you to buy a property, to have a right to buy the property. So just as, as a summary of what we're going to talk about in the purchase and sale agreement section, we're going to talk about the parties, uh, what the property would look like, and talk about something called the deposit and the purchase price, due diligence, representations and warranties, we're talking about closing conditions, 
and then remedies. Remedies, what happens when something goes wrong. So we'll talk about these in more, in more depth now. So first and foremost is the property. What am I buying? The whole point of a purchase and sale agreement is for you to buy something. And what you are going to be buying is whatever is specified in the purchase and sale agreement. So, you know, oftentimes when, when you think about real estate, you're like, okay, I'm going to go buy this parcel of land, or I'm going to go buy this building. And, and that's, you think of it at, at a surface level, but you want to think about it and you need to think about it in a more analytical, legalistic perspective, because ultimately at the end of the day, what property is, it's just a, it's just a bundle of rights. It could be um, the right to occupy something. It could be the right to build something. It could be this physical building we're in here. So you need to understand really what is it that you're buying. There are two main types of interests that you could buy with maybe a third one uh, that's less prominent. So the three types would be fee simple, leasehold, and condo. So let's start with fee simple. This is a legal word that is much more impressive than it actually sounds. So, or I should say less impressive than it actually sounds. When you think of like, I'm going to go buy a house, you're buying the fee symbol interest. It means that like you actually own the dirt, you own the house. It's just the, the basic idea of what you think of logically when you buy land. Uh, sort of on the, on the other end of that is a leasehold. So if you are a tenant at, let's say, you know, an apartment building. So you're living in an apartment building, you have a lease. You you don't own that apartment building. You have a right to occupy the building. It's a pretty good right because the landlord can't just come in and kick you out. But you have a right to occupy the build the, your apartment unit on certain specified terms. So that that makes sense, and I think is kind of logical um, and obvious from an apartment rental perspective. Like if you're just an individual renting an apartment, but but a leasehold also comes up in a purchase and sale context. So here's a good, here's a concrete example. Um, Stanford Research Park up in the Bay Area. That is um, an area where the university owns a huge portion of extremely valuable land that has um, research parks developed on. In a lot of instances, you have major institutional landowners and developers who have built large life science campuses, office buildings, when they're not actually buying the fee simple interest of the land. So rather than buying the land itself from Stanford, the buyers will lease the land from, the, from Stanford on call it like a 50 year lease or a 60 year lease. And there's a variety of reasons you know, tax reasons and political reasons why people structure things like that. But the point is, you're not always buying the dirt. And you want to understand, are you getting into a leasehold deal? It's also referred to as a ground lease. If you hear the word ground lease, ground lease means you can think of it as long-term lease. So you also, um, you want to understand whether you're, oh, and I almost skipped over the third one, so condo. So condo is kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, if you are in a apartment building, the way that I always think of the difference between an apartment and a condo is you can buy a condo, you don't buy an apartment, but they're really the same thing. Like you might hear like, oh, I, you know, your friend might say, oh, I just bought a condo. And then you go there and you're like, this looks like an apartment. It's because they're they're really the same thing. The idea is that it's not a standalone structure, and you're buying a you're buying this kind of the space within a larger building. Um, so just just something to keep in mind there. Okay, so I'm going to skip over improvements in the interest of time. Again, you want to understand what you're buying. If if it's not obvious, so let's say that you're. I said I'm going to skip over. I'm going to talk about one thing actually. Let's say you're buying a, um, a warehouse and it has, it's one of these high-end Amazon warehouses that has sophisticated racks 
and sophisticated robotics equipment that picks orders and stuff like that, and, and you're, you're, you're buying this, are you buying are you buying that equipment? Does anybody want to take a guess? Or does anybody know? So I, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. It depends on what the purchase the purchase agreement says. Who owns that equipment that, that's in there? Even if it's bolted to the walls, those are often fixtures. But the point is that equipment can be millions, if not tens of millions of dollars. You, you better know whether you're going to get it or not when you close the deal. The last thing you want to do is close the deal and you show up and all that equipment's gone. Everyone's going to have a bad day if that happens. And same thing for tangible personal property like, like furniture, artwork. Is If this stuff is important, you want to make sure to outline in your purchase agreement who's going to get it. Now, you know, we talked a lot in the joint venture portion about development. Um, this, the, the, the quote unquote property comes into play for, for a development con the development situation in a little bit more subtle way too. So in, in certain jurisdictions in the United States, you can have, um, properties built through what's called development credits. So a governmental entity in most areas of the United States, um, that most of you would work in they have the government has the right to say whether you can build a property or not that's just fact and one way that they control that is through certain payments that get made to the government and some cities and counties have these idea called development credits so if you want to build let's say an office building or something you might have to give them so many development credits you can think of them as like little tokens um and you can, and th those tokens are a property, right? So if I if I own a piece of property and I also own some development credits, I, I probably paid money for those development credits or I did something. I created, I, I built a road or something that created those, me having the right to have these development credits. So if I am now on the other side, if I'm the buyer of a building, I want to understand whether I'm buying, if I'm also getting my seller's development credits, or if I'm going to have to buy those myself. And so it's, 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 it's sort of abstract, but the point is approvals can be a type of property that's transferred. You never want to just assume that the, the approvals that someone else got or the development credits that someone else earned, that those are going to follow along with the property because that's not always the case. Okay. So the money. So a deposit is one of the most basic yet important things in a purchase and sale agreement. So just stepping back for a second, there are really two competing interests when two parties come together, a buyer and seller come together. The seller wants certainty of execution. They want to know that if they allow some person to put the property under contract, that that person's actually going to buy the property. At the end of the, at the end of the escrow, so seller wants certainty of execution. The buyer is in the the complete opposite position. They want to be able to get out of the deal if something bad happens, or or if they simply don't want to buy the property anymore. So you you have this this tension that exists, and in a purchase and sale agreement, in various different contexts, you talk about when can the buyer get the deposit back, when are they going to forfeit it. So now that we've established that, the way that the deposit works is you sign the purchase agreement and then you put up some amount of money. And it depends on the size of the deal. Think anywhere between half a percent to 5%. It depends on the market size of the deal. There's so many factors, but it's usually, the point is it's usually a, a substantial enough amount of money that your buyer is going to be disincentivized from walking away. Um, usually you put it in within a couple of days after you sign the purchase agreement, usually between one to three business days. And there can also be times that you have to put in more money. That's usually referred to as an additional deposit. So if you have a, a deal that's a development deal, so someone's buying a raw piece of land, 
those tend to be longer escrow periods. So you could say um, the developer has 60 days to do their due diligence on the property, and then they have another six months to close on the property. The seller might say, man, I'm, I'm really tying up my property for a long period of time. I want to know that you're really serious moving forward. So you might require as a seller, you might say, okay, you put in um, $500,000 when you initially signed. Now, when you've, you've told me that you're satisfied with the property, but you need to just, you need more time for whatever to get approvals from the government or um, get your equity investor lined up. The seller might say, I want an additional deposit of another $500,000. So you might have to put up more money. So, you know, how do you get the money back? That's what the, that's what the buyer always wants to know. In what instances can I get it back? Generally speaking, during the due diligence period, so the, the buyer can get their money back for any reason. They don't even have to have a reason. They can say, hey, I don't want to do the deal anymore. I'm out. Give me my deposit back. There's exceptions to that, but the, the overall market position is, is that. You can get your money back for any reason during due diligence. Um, you'll see here that there's an objection, right? Um, so let's say that there is, let's say that you complete your due diligence on the property and your deposit is now presumably non-refundable. Sometimes if certain things happen, such as um, maybe there's a new lien that was put on the property, or maybe there was um, a fire at the property, you might have an ability to say, hey, let's let's talk about this. And if it's something serious enough, you may have the right to get the deposit back. So the purchase price is, it, it's, what, it's what it sounds like. It's how much you're willing to pay for the building, but that's not always the whole story. So I'm actually working on a deal currently right now that we're representing the seller and the purchase price is 200 it's 200 million dollars but we're giving the buyer credits towards their purchase price in the amount of 50 million dollars so okay it's going to cost the buyer is it going to cost the buyer 200 million or 150 million I mean, it's, it depends how you look at it. It depends on what the details of the credits are. And now I, I realize that's kind of abstract. So the way that the credits came about is the property has a tenant in there. And the tenant has a right to have the landlord, so whoever owns the property, build certain improvements over time. And the parties worked out that that landlord obligation is about $50 million. And so the buyer said, look, I really want to buy this building. I think it's worth $200 million, but I've got to put in 50 million over the next three years. So this, so our client said, okay, like we, we get that. And we're, because we really want to sell the building, we're willing to give it to you. We're willing to give you a credit. So our client's giving a credit of $50 million. And you might just ask, well, why even have the credits? Why not just reduce the purchase price down to 150 million and not have a credit? There can be reasons to do credits. One reason would be um, it looks really good on a banker's um, deal sheet that they sold the property for a higher amount of money, even if the net proceeds were lower. There's lots of different reasons. There's tax reasons. They may have property in the adjacent area where they want to show a higher value of the sale. So, yeah, but. Curiosity, what kind of property is that deal that you're speaking of? Is it, uh, is it a commercial shopping center or is it an apartment building? It's an office building. Office. It's an office building with one tenant. And how do those credits like come about? Is it at the at the end where you know, like it's two hundred million and there is fifty million dollars credit? So at the bottom line, is that how or when does that credit come about? Like, like when is it coming in? Yeah. Like in the overall deal timeline? Yeah. So um, it should come about at the very beginning because it's it's 
such a big number and it's such a big proportion of the purchase price. Um, if you know if you're dealing with sophisticated parties, oftentimes like these are the types of things that brokers look out for to try to add value to the transaction. And so it, it should something like this should get addressed early on. Um, sometimes it doesn't, even with sophisticated parties, and the way it could come up is um, you sign a purchase agreement, you're completely silent on the credits, and the buyer is reviewing the lease as part of their due diligence. And they say like, wait, what is this? Like, I'm going to have to put in how much money over the course of this lease? Then they could turn to the seller and they could say, hey, you know, you told me that, that this is what the property costs, but really if, if I am not getting a credit for these obligations under the lease, my overall money that I have to be in the property is much higher. So it could come up later. When it comes up later, that's the kind of thing that kills deals, um, makes people very upset. So kind of similar to the theme with joint ventures, you want to talk about these types of things very early. It's a good question. Okay. So due diligence basics. Um, for the most part, the, regardless of whether it is a office building or a multifamily building or a shopping center, the type of due diligence that you do, pretty much the same. You want to do a physical inspection of the property. So you, you, know, you want to have somebody who, you know, it would, it's certainly not going to be the person who is doing the buying. It's usually the person doing the buying is more of a business person than somebody who knows, is able to look at an air conditioning unit and identify whether the $5 million air conditioning unit is going to be break or something. So you have to engage um, a property condition inspector. So you want to do uh, inspection, physical inspections. You want to do environmental inspections. This is this is a big deal, um, especially in California. It's important in all in all areas. You want to understand whether the property has environmental issues, because if it does, and you haven't done your due diligence, you could be stepping into enormous liability. So that's a whole nother topic, but just know. You need to do environmental due diligence when you when you buy, especially commercial real property. Um, you want to understand what is on the property from a uh, encumbrance perspective. How, just by a show of hands, who knows what an, an encumbrance is? Okay, so an, an encumbrance is something that it, it is a document that has been recorded on the property, meaning that it's legally binding on the property that imposes some obligation on the landowner, whether that's an affirmative obligation, meaning that you have to do something or a restriction, meaning that you can't do something. So example would be if you want to build a shopping mall on this piece of property, but there's an encumbrance on the property that says no shopping malls or you can't sell liquor. So let's say that you want to build a restaurant. Big source of revenue for many restaurants is being able to sell alcohol. If there's been a, an encumbrance or restriction recorded against the property that prohibits you from selling alcohol, that, that's a big problem because you're going to all of a sudden have this really nice restaurant building ready for a tenant. You can't sell alcohol and you're not going to have a restaurant then. So the point about this is that that's an example of the legal condition of the property. And you um, want to understand what that is before moving forward. This is something that a lawyer would often look into and then identify them to the client. But the exception where a lawyer might not look into it is if this is a smaller deal. So if you're out there doing a smaller deal and you're doing this yourself, you, you have to be on the lookout for this, which can be very challenging if you're not a lawyer. Yeah. Does the seller have any like legal obligation to tell you like this has like, an environmental issue or is it up to the buyer to figure that out? So it's a good question. Um, the, the, you, if you're the buyer, you should be assuming the answer is no. Yeah. Um, you know, there's fraud. If somebody is sort of in, you know, the common usage of the word fraud, right? If somebody's committing fraud to, to induce you to enter into the transaction, then, you know, 
there's probably some, you could probably argue that they have a duty to disclose certain things. But in a purchase agreement, there's usually two or three pages dedicated to, we have no duty to disclose. And we're going to we're going to say it in 20 different ways. And you're going to initial that that's the case. So it's very much, a, you know, as is, where is, and you better do your due diligence. Um, and we got a question from um, the Zoom, which I'll, I'll answer right now. So the, the question was, how early in negotiations does the GC get involved? And so you can think of that as either the general counsel or, or outside counsel. Um, they should be engaged at the very beginning of the transaction. So my recommendation is always at the letter of intent stage. Letter of intent is basically a one pager that says what the terms of the deal are. I recommend getting the lawyer involved at that stage to avoid heartburn down the road if things don't go the way that you wanted them to go. Um, but at, at the very latest, absolute very latest, once you have an initial draft of the purchase agreement, the first thing you should do, that comes in your inbox, you hit forward and you send it to your lawyer, whether that's your in-house lawyer or your outside lawyer, you get that over right away. Okay, so um, we're, we're running out of time here. Um, the other, a uh, couple of things I want to touch on real quick before we wrap up is you want to think about what do you need from a business perspective to get comfortable um, to close a deal? So let's say that you have a lease out there um, on a single tenant building. You want to know that the lease is okay, that the, that the tenant's still paying rent under the lease, that the, 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 the tenant doesn't have any complaints against the landlord that might give them a right to terminate. The way that you get that comfort is called an estoppel certificate. So it's basically a document that the tenant signs that says, hey, everything's okay with our lease. So that once you buy the property, the tenant can't say, oh, just kidding. The landlord's done a terrible job and I have all these claims. And now you're my landlord and you have to pay. Them. So the way that you get comfortable as a buyer is an estoppel certificate. Okay, so I'm gonna to jump to the last slide here, which is remedy. So this is what happens when things go wrong. This is one of the more negotiated points in a purchase and sale agreement. Again, keeping in mind, the deposit is huge, very central in these deals. So if you're the seller and your buyer breaches its obligation to buy the property at closing, it's pretty obvious you should be able to keep the deposit. That's the whole point of the deposit. But there's other instances. Maybe the maybe the buyer um, did something that they were prohibited from doing under the purchase and sale agreement. They breached the purchase and sale agreement. Not that they didn't buy the property when they were obligated to do so, but maybe they went and they went and uh, trash talked you to their tenant. That could, that would be a breach, and arguably there's instances where. The seller might be able to terminate and keep the deposit. These types of things are negotiated, um, but it, it highlights the importance of actually reading the document. No, don't just assume the only way to lose your deposit is if you don't show up for closing. On the other side of it is, what if you're the buyer and the seller breaches? What if they made a representation? So like, what if they stated something to be true in the purchase agreement and it turns out it wasn't true? Or what if... The seller doesn't show up for showing. They say, ah, oh, too bad, I'm going to sell to somebody else. As a buyer, you want to be able to terminate and get your deposit back. You may want to use what's called specific performance. I think that might be the one legal term that I've used this entire hour. Specific performance, what that means is you have the right to make the other person do what they said they were going to do. So it usually comes up in the context of conveying property. So let's say that you're a buyer and the seller says, you know, I'm not going to sell the property. I'm going to go sell it to somebody else because they're, they're going to pay me more money. As the buyer, you say, I'm going to sue you for specific performance. The judge is going to order you, Mr. Seller, to perform your obligation to sell to me. So that's what specific performance is. And then last point here, recovery of costs. If you're a buyer and your seller is breaching, in, in addition to losing the opportunity to buy the property, you now 
you've probably spent a lot of money on due diligence. You've probably spent a lot of money with your lawyer negotiating a purchase agreement. Maybe you've gone to a lender and you've paid a commitment fee to receive financing in the future. The point is you could have a few hundred thousand dollars of these costs that now because the seller decided that they wanted to be bad, that now you're like, okay, I don't get to do my deal and I'm out $300,000 in these pursuit costs on this deal. I mean, that doesn't seem fair. So what a buyer, a savvy buyer will do when they're negotiating the purchase agreement is they will say, okay, seller, if you breach, not only do I get to get out of the deal, but you have to pay me back for the pursuit costs that I've, that I've expended. So it, it gives another disincentive to the seller to, to ensure that they hold up their end of the bargain. So I'm about out of time. I wanted to save one minute for any questions uh, that anybody might have on purchase and sale agreements. How long are what was it entitlements? Was that a question? Okay, so for, for folks on the Zoom, the question was, um, how long do entitlements typically take in order to receive? It varies dramatically by jurisdiction. Um, it could be 60 days, which would be extremely fast. Um, I think if, you, if you're going to be a developer, thinking of a timeline that's going to be reasonable in most instances, it's probably about a year, anywhere from six months to a year. It depends on the jurisdiction you're in. If you're in Los Angeles, where stuff moves slowly often, things can be backed up, you're looking at a long time. If you're in um, a smaller jurisdiction, let's say you're in, um, you know, there's been a lot of development in Utah lately, like Salt Lake City has been kind of expanding. And you can think of like jurisdictions where there's not as much economic activity compared to LA or New York, you might be able to push your entitlements through in four to six months. So it's it's very important to understand when you're um, looking at a property that you talk to somebody who's very familiar, who's local in that area, and then they, they can tell you the answer to that question. It's, it's a really good question, very important question, because especially if you're trying to maybe time the market a little bit, if you buy a piece of property and it takes you two years to get your, um, your entitlements and now maybe interest rates have gone up or other people have completed their buildings and there's too much supply now that could change the whole calculation. So um, yeah, it's important to understand how long it's gonna take. Anything else? Um, let's say a company was um, trying to conduct due diligence for a property that they're looking at and they hire like an outside company to do that. How would they know that the due diligence was completed in its entirety? Yeah, that goes to trust and the relationship you have with your inspector. So um, people often use repeat inspectors um, and they develop relationships with them because it comes down to trust. Because are you know if somebody blows the inspection on a hundred million build hundred million dollar building, you get a be able to get hundred million bucks or whatever your damages were from some property inspector, probably not. So there's a lot of trust that goes into selecting. And so unfortunately, um, we're out of time. And so uh, I'd like to introduce Dan Liffman. All right, uh, uh, we'll pick up with real estate basic legal principles in five minutes. So take a five minute break, be back at 2.06. All right, thank you. Thanks, Alex. Sure. Um, you provided a point of agreement. How are you, Mr. Right. How are you doing? Uh, Rich Price Oh, nice. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good to meet you. How's uh, the presidency going? It's going well. Uh, you kind of like this. Uh, and this was so yeah, it's great. It's great. It was the best in 10 years ago. I almost appreciate it. So, the land price started in 2021. Yeah. So, now that we have the next year, there is no other thing I want to do like this too. Okay, good. I want to. It's been great.
So that's good. one so aspect. So what do you guys think of the class? We, we have so one statement, and then uh, you buy, you buy a we're trying to reduce the average lot in the next week, but we'll be out of thousand dollars. And then we have some, you might say, we're very professional developments. We're okay. And then you have some good people showing up. And there's a good option. Hopefully so. We heard back usually on how smart this is in my Okay. I'm just passing us through their recruitment, and then I reach out to 30 plus other companies. Oh, no, sorry. Like, like let's say that. I want yeah four hundred thousand dollars. The other person actually, said actually, at the law school, yes, okay. uh, but uh, the so business school, right. uh, not sure. so much, right? Because we need JDs. Uh, okay. But we do have clients that may be interested in firing right out of college. Um, okay. or right out of business school. Yeah. So um, let me um, okay. Canvas the group and see if they have any clients that are interested in coming. Tell me the details of the event. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. definitely will. Purchase. Yeah, because yes. I feel like you guys, this program is geared towards the business side. We're just, we're the lawyers that show up that uh, tell you what to contact your GD or the lawyer about. So, 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 the, pro so the process that, that uh, kind of goes towards clients that, that would be interested, I think. Right. Right. So, like, let's say that. Yeah. So just okay, to, awesome. Yeah, let's say that. And then uh, we also are trying for the bus tour again. Part. Okay. Yeah. And so we are going through like the an overall. application for funding and all that with the uh, school. Like the overall. Okay. Um, um, so is it like an architecture tour? Or something? Um, no, but we're going to try so to go back next. When you go to sell it, okay. this is going to be like uh, the bus driver picks us up. You would get a uh, charter the bus, and then we'll go to that, like Buckingham Investments. Or whatever. We go out to Marcus Mill Chap. Yeah. Okay. And then, like, let's say that you were. Yeah. And so we you describe it sounds like you would not be able to do it. Guys, you're probably not going to get it. Um, and so you don't have to worry about other thing that uh, coming up is USC uh, uh, done as so a right. real estate and business conference. Uh, and uh, my focus would be so I'm not planning for that. Uh, okay. And so okay, so I think it might actually be a good topic to take the state of so uh, real estate, so, uh, Southern California, uh, Southern California, uh, uh, MBA so and undergrad program. So, uh, yeah. you know, if you bought it for across a million LA, LA what about the you guys, know. USC, UCLA, you should yeah. say maybe Pepperdine. Yeah. I don't know if Pepperdine is doing anything right now. Right. So, if we could get more like you and they, they should three agree. others, I think that would be a good panel for everybody to see, like, because everybody's concerned right now about the yeah, pipeline so, of kids coming up. No, so it's, hired. so it's yeah, everybody's concerned about you know the like, percentage. What do they know about once showing up for work, right? Yeah, and what then percentage what the what the is like, like and what's yeah. the are these programs prepared for everybody? Percentage you work in like a market village, like, yeah, or like, uh, a bank in America, or a cargo, or you face some people over a trauma. So, if they go in, there's a lot of those type of people in this event. So, yeah, you're I was going to talk to you. Certificate you're organizers all right. too. Yeah. Uh, geez, you all should be doing something similar to you at some point. At some point, like a conference where you have a bunch of people, you know, names come in, yeah. puts the program on the map, the you know, for reading. Yeah. I definitely want to do so. Yeah. I was making similar in how it's being to hire the best leaders. Yeah, website and everything. Yeah, just do it like okay. six months after. So so it's like yeah, every half year yeah. they'll close the state. So PCLA is not even on the radar right now. And so they yeah, used to do not something called the property symposium, but they have enough yeah. sorrow symposium in the past eight years, years 10 years. Um, uh, so so you could fill that void. I'm always going to call. So you have lost at least throughout the house. So I got a lot of ideas. Send me an email. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you. Hi. It's really good. Yeah. Absolutely. Hi, um, I came in a few minutes late. I have an introduction. I was able to get your name. Oh, no, okay. Well, okay. 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 Yeah, what like, uh, 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 yeah, 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 okay, everybody can have our seats. We're gonna resume in just a little bit. Talk about like your experience. Um, okay, have a good day. Um,
So if I could um, go on the accounts. Uh, yeah, 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 look, no, it's um, Alexander Davis. Can you type in Alexander Davis, Mayor of the UW Law? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you Okay. All right. Uh, so, all right. So everybody have a seat. We're going to commence, recommence with uh, what we should have started with, but I got sidetracked. I had a note purchase going on today and uh, we had to wrap up on, uh, we had divided a client's, um, well, a lender's note into two pieces, an A piece and a B piece. And my client bought the B piece and then they just bought the A piece today. Um, so that deal had to close um, before sundown in New York because everybody on the New York side was Orthodox Jewish and wasn't going to work after sundown. So apologies. We're doing the part that we should have started out with now, which is real estate legal principles, um, which hopefully you picked up some from Alex Davis, and maybe you'll remember some of what Alex Davis taught you as I ask you questions. Now, I, I'm not gonna um, ask for volunteers. I'm just gonna go through the room, um, starting in the front. So congratulations. What are the elements of an enforceable real estate contract? Do you have any idea? You can just throw out one. What do you need for an enforceable contract? Um... Okay, next. Uh, due diligence. Due diligence is a good thing to do, but it doesn't matter for an enforceable contract. Next. Um, an LOI. An LOI is definitely something that you want to have, but doesn't matter for an enforceable contract. I mean, uh, signature from the other party, from both parties. Signatures. We're getting very, very warm. So we've tried a whole row. I don't think you all know what an enforceable contract entails, do you? But you have some idea, signatures. So this is these are the elements. These are the technical legal elements for you to have a binding legal contract with somebody that you're entering into, especially we're talking about real estate contracts where there's a statute of frauds. Okay, so you're gonna have to comply with the statute of frauds, which requires it that the contract be in writing with sufficient specificity as to the property that you were talking about. So you need an offer, you need an acceptance of the offer, you need consideration. Raise your hand if you know what consideration is. Yeah, back there. You have to give something or forbear from doing something. That is consideration, a forbearance or a price. You've given money, you've said, I'm not going to do something, you've given up some rights, or you've, uh, or you've given some asset. So that's consideration. In writing, for a real estate contract to be binding, it has to be in writing with sufficient specificity as to the property. Like I said, there has to be mutuality or an intent to be bound and that can be covered by a simple sentence saying that the parties intend to agree as follows and then you sign and then capacity right so uh if you work in a nursing home and you uh are armed with the knowledge that you learned here and you go and try to have some dying um person who's incapacitated try to sign over all of their property to you and then record the deed, that person does not have capacity to enter into that contract. And if their children or issue would like to challenge it, the enforceability of that contract, they would have a winning argument on capacity that there is no binding contract. So these are the elements of a contract. And if you take contracts in law school, you will study these for a month, maybe two months. All right, so that's what it takes to have a contract. Now, what is it when a party to a real estate contract, what is it 
when a party to a real estate contract does not fulfill its promises, okay? So there's a fair amount of that going on in office space right now, right? Office Offices are not doing well in this market because people don't want to come back to the office. Employers are trying to force people back to the office. Gradually, they are coming back, but not fast enough for there to be tremendous demand for office space. And we've built a lot of office space over the past 20 to 40 years. So a lot of people are breaking their office real estate contracts, Okay, whether that's leases, financing, or purchase and sales. So what is it called when you decide to stop paying interest on your loan? Second, uh, this is now the third row. Breach or default. Breach or default. Terrific. Or an event of default. The difference between default and event of default is that an event of default usually triggers remedies under your contract. A default usually triggers a cure period, after which you have an event of default. And once you have an event of default, you are in remedies. Okay. So what are the two main methods of enforcing a real estate contract? We'll continue down the road. Any idea how you would enforce any contract, but in particular, a real estate contract? What was that? Okay. What would you seek? Next row. Okay. No, no, no. Okay, if I lost a million dollars, right, because I was going to buy the property that you're selling, but you decided to sell it to somebody else, and it cost me a million dollars to diligence the property, and I had another property I would have bought, but I didn't buy it because I relied on my purchase and sale contract with you, and you broke it, I would have damages, okay? And if instead of wanting to get that $1 million back, I wanted to force you to sell me the property because we had a binding contract, I would seek specific performance, okay? That means you perform on your contract that you entered into. So those are the two main methods of enforcing a contract. You can seek damages or you can seek specific performance. All right, how do you know who has rights in real property? I think Alex Davis went over this a little bit. So next row back, we're gonna start on this side by the door, yes you. How do you know who has rights in the real property that you're looking at financing, entering into a JV on, or buying, or leasing? You can ask them, that's good, due diligence, ask them. Who else can you ask? The LA County's recorder's office, that's exactly right. but. Who do you interface with that actually goes over to the recorder's office and goes through all the deeds? The bank. The bank also interacts with these people that are not the bank who interact with the recorder's office. Yeah. Title? Title company. That's exactly right. Your best friend is the title company. Okay, so there are title insurance companies. They go to the county recorder's office. They get a fee to do it. They then tell you all of the documents that are recorded at the county recorder's office and give you a copy of all of them so that you could see what documents are recorded, what agreements, easements, deeds, everything that's recorded against that particular property. Okay, so there's also unrecorded documents like leases and licenses. Typically, you don't record leases. Like if you went to um, Starbucks, Starbucks probably has a lease with the building owner. That lease is almost certainly not recorded, but they still have an interest in the property, right? So they have an unrecorded interest in the property. So that's where the diligence asking your counterparty that owns the property, what leases they have entered into um, comes into play. So you check with the title insurance company who goes down to the county's official records and pulls over all the documents. And then you ask the owner, for all of the leases, licenses, and unrecorded documents. And then you usually want to have them represent to you what they have that's not recorded. All right. Now, Alex definitely went over this. What are the types of interests in real property? Now, I've got a few more interests than Alex did. So I think we left off. Okay. Next row back. 
president of the group, interest in real property. Do you remember one type of interest? All right, we'll go down the road. Type of interest in real property. Next. What was that? B, good. All right, do you know one? Okay, next. A what? Lean? Uh, yeah, all right, I'll give you a lean. Lean is uh, what a deed of trust or a mortgage is. Uh, you report it against ownership of the property and it is an interest in the property. So here are the main types of uh, interests. You've got fee or fee simple absolute ownership. That's what you typically think of as ownership. Option, that's an interest in land. You can have the option to purchase a property, which you would report. A leasehold interest, that's if you have a long-term lease on the property, or you could even record a memorandum of a short-term lease. An easement, um, I have, uh, I actually own my neighbor's backyard. True story. He has an easement over his, the backyard, so I can't use it because he has an easement which is exclusive. So he has the exclusive use of this portion of the property that I actually own. So easements are very powerful tools. Um, they can be similar to uh, ownership if they're exclusive. I mean, because what are you gonna do other than use the property? And if you have the exclusive use to it through an easement and that easement's recorded and it's superior to all other interests in the land, then you've got basic ownership. Uh, restrictive covenants. Restrictive covenants can uh, be documents that are reported against the property that say you're not going to operate this property as, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z. There's usually uh, a host of uh, uses that people want to prohibit um, when they record restrictive covenants, and they're the ones that you would think of. Condominium association. So uh, condominium is a type of uh, property ownership. Um, and so when you have a condominium, you are subject to an owner's association um, and you pay dues to the owner's association and you sign on to the association agreement. And then the association is supposed to take care of basic property management things with respect to the common areas of the condominium building. So those are the basics, and you can have a lien on a property if you're a lender. Um, so that's it. Now, typically, we would go into fund formation and funding next, um, but Mark Jeffries, who is uh, our presenter on fund formation, he's the general counsel for uh, 3650 REIT. I believe he's in uh, Morocco. So uh, I encourage you to look at his slides because they are filled with information about forming your own real estate fund if you find investors, um, retirement funds, pension funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, uh, wealthy individuals that want to contribute money. So places like Blackstone, they raise funds. Starwood, they raise funds. 3650 Reed. They raise funds and then they invest the money. They guarantee their investors a return. And then they go out and they invest the money that they've raised. Okay. Uh, but we're going to take another short break. Uh, we'll recommence at, uh, I think, 2.30. 2.30, we'll restart with leasing. Trisha Greenlee will be here to present on leasing. Um, but again, go through these slides. They're rich with information. And I apologize for Mark not being able to make it. Again, he's out of the country. Did you have a question? Yeah, what's the biggest difference between a REIT and a private equity firm? Uh, so REITs are given a certain tax treatment, right? So they're given a real estate investment uh, uh, trust treat tax treatment. So there's only certain types of investment income that qualify as REIT income. Whereas hedge funds and uh, private equity funds, they are just um, uh, generic investment funds that can make any type of investment and they can uh, accept all different kinds of income. They are just uh, uh, investment vehicles that are private 
and avoid certain securities regulations, the 33, 34, 39, and 40 Act regulations by having wealthy individual investors and limiting the number of investors that they have. So there are uh, certain workarounds to get around securities regulations, and that is essentially what hedge funds and uh, private equity do. And there's not much difference. Usually private equity, um, they have a mandatory hold where you can't get out of your private equity investment for five, 10 years, and hedge funds tend to be more liquid where you can enter and exit a hedge fund um, when you wanna buy and sell. But REITs are similar in that they use the same path to avoid securities regulation, but then they go, they have to qualify for a certain tax treatment to qualify to be a REIT. So they have certain types of income that are acceptable as real estate income and they can't make other investments. All right, any other questions on basic real estate principles or uh, fund formation? Okay, we'll, we'll recommence with leases. And if Trisha isn't here yet, we'll do finance first. All right, you have another five minutes. Oops. Yeah. Five minute break. Yep.
Hugo real fast. Because I really this is more recent. I forwarded the one you guys sent me last night, this morning, whenever it was. Yeah, maybe yeah. you should need to put the right slides in. No, or not, I mean, flash guys. No, I took the right slides in. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 Or if it's easier, I don't want to see it. I didn't 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 want to see it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Yeah, so save the deck on there from your email and okay. then put it on this laptop. Uh, you know, I can forward it as well. Give me one second. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, we all are partners with the same firm. Mayor Brown. So what about the minimum that you guys do as a minimum? I do construction finances and usually. So the one I used today is correct. Should be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she has five, like really, really large leases. And some small releases. And the auto jack is released here? Alex does uh, first sales and JC is usually in the $250 million. Yeah. 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 
Sorry, we're trying to get the next slides up, Patricia. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Well, I'm going to start having to try and kind of hang it off from the student teams here. Well, I mean, you can really go that way. Like, I haven't like, so, yeah. Well, I'm going to try to update that. Well, thank you for the video. No, but I'm on um, So I have a data team and a data team and a benefit stuff. Keep on a little work now. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. That's going to be out. There we go. Cool. Finally. Sorry about that. There we go. Um, so you want to take this? Yes. Cool. So, so I spot you. And there are clickers. This was the Yeah, yeah. yeah.
Which is the next slide? Uh, Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Trisha Greenlee, and I think like everyone else you're hearing from today, I am a partner with Mayor Brown uh, here in Los Angeles, and um, I'm in their real estate department. Uh, I have specifically have a uh, practice that is dedicated to commercial leasing, which is why I get to um, come give these presentations about it. Uh, that's all I've done for about the last 15 years. So um, kind of unusual, but I like it. So get started. What's a commercial lease? Just for really generally, um, it's a binding agreement between a property owner and a business, a company uh, or other business tenant that outlines the terms uh, under which the tenant is going to occupy space, all or a portion of the property of the owner. Um, how many of you have leased, rented an apartment or house or anything like that? Okay, similar concept, right? Um, the difference is that when you enter into a residential lease, the residential leases are all gonna be, like the use is always the same. Someone's gonna live in the property that's being leased. So there's very little variation in residential leases um, on, on terms. They're, they're gonna be different, like your rent is gonna be different, the amount of rent you pay, and the space you're living in is gonna be different, but pretty much everything else is gonna stay the same. And so you see there's some like California Association of Realtor forms that are typically the ones used for residential leases and you don't see much beyond that. Um, Commercial leasing is totally different because as you see here, we deal with a lot of different uses um, among buildings and different users are going to have different needs. Um, and so we have to accommodate um, those considerations when we're doing commercial leases. Um, just for instance, like your office tenants are these days, I mean, there aren't a lot of them, um, but they're gonna want like the use of communal spaces, um, like conference rooms. They're gonna like proximity to things like public transportation um, and amenities, like things that they can have at the property to attract employees. That's become a, good, a big focus for office tenants. Retail tenants are different. They're gonna want um, a location that allows them a lot of visibility and gets them a lot of foot traffic, right? Because they're gonna want customers coming in the door. Um, they're often gonna be a little more focused on like design of their space um, than a, a, a typical office tenant's gonna be. And if they're like a restaurant, uh, they're gonna need space that they can use cooking equipment in because um, you can't just use standard you know, restaurant type equipment in any kind of space. Uh, industrial, when you're driving along the freeway to like Palm Springs or something, you see these big giant box buildings. Those are industrial spaces. And they, basically they're not typically much more than that big giant box you're seeing. They're not gonna have any kind of fun amenities or anything. Um, it's like the Amazons of the world using those as their storage, you know, for, for products and things like that. 
um, life science lab, which is my specialty, has needs, you know, similar similar to those of office tenants, but a little more specialized. Uh, lab tenants are doing research and will be things like utilities available 24-7. Uh, they're going to need the ability to use hazardous materials in their space, which is a pretty unusual um, things for tenants to be able to do. Uh, and because of things like that, they're gonna need more frequent air exchanges, different types of airflow. So the designs of their spaces are gonna be different than your standard office tenant. They're gonna have different concerns. Um, and then like high tech R&D may be similar to that. And uh, then there's not listed here, but like data center. Data center leasing is super specialized. I can't, I don't, can't do data center leasing leases myself uh, because they're so technical. Um, they tend to really focus on availability of utilities and pooling um, that isn't required by any other kind of tenant. So their, their leases are gonna look pretty different. So commercial leases fall into three buckets and these three buckets are based on what the tenant payments for and how they pay it. So we think of tenants paying rent. So if you're paying rent for your apartment, you just pay your $2,000 a month and that's it. Um, there is a component of that for our commercial tenants as well. But on top of that, commercial landlords have expenses that they pay to operate and maintain uh, their buildings. And they're going to want to pass those costs on to their tenants one way or another. And so the first two um, categories here are, are relate to that. How, how are those the rent and those operating costs paid for? So a gross lease or a modified lease is, is one where uh, the tenant's going to pay a lump sum like that $2,000 that you pay for your apartment um, and not worry about anything else. That number is going to include the landlord's estimation of its cost to operate um, the project for the given year broken down you know, monthly for payment. And so the tenant only has to worry about one number. Um, they don't have to worry about that changing over the course of the term. Uh, so you're going to see this mostly in like office leases where they're just going to pay um, their base rental amount. Everything's included. Um, a modified gross lease is very similar to that, but carves out maybe a few categories that the tenant is going to be responsible for on top of that um, rent number, you commonly you'll see utilities. So these are things that the tenant that um, tenant may control the use of specific to their space. So uh, utilities is probably the biggest one, janitorial expenses. Uh, maybe tenants want more janitorial than others. Yeah. Is it their own specific utilities or like, yes. So the building, okay. Yeah, um, good question. Or does that include like communal spaces and office buildings? So when we're carving out costs on a, a modified gross lease, that's going to be specific to the tenant's space. So utilities provided to them. Um, so they may have a set, they'll be able to have a separate meter that that so they'll know how much they're using and, and need to pay for every month. Um, and janitorial contracts that are separate, right? So that it's just going to be outside the broader pool of expenses that the landlord's paying for, which might include other tenant spaces and common spaces. And office buildings, do they have their own meters or? Uh, it depends. Okay. Uh, it's not uncommon for maybe a full building, uh, full full floor tenant to have it's a separate meter or a sub meter that can be uh, read, but your smaller tenants like on a floor won't. So that would be growth, there would be Thing, just the gross. Yeah, yes, exactly. So the, the, the landlord's going to estimate about how much electricity will each of these tenants use on a monthly basis. 
and, and factor that into the rent number that they're given. To them. Um, the triple net is the opposite. Uh, the tenant in a triple net lease is going to see a base rent number that will escalate over the term of the lease by a certain percentage, typically like 3% per year. And then they're going to have a separate bucket of expenses for um, these operating costs we're talking about. So things like insurance, um, taxes that are paid for by the landlord, uh, the maintenance of the building, repairs, um, if amenities are being provided, if there's a gym at, at the project, the cost of operating the gym, all of these costs are going to then be packaged up and, and filtered through to the tenants um, so that the, the landlord isn't really putting, like having to come out of its own pocket on an annual basis. Um, this is gonna be structured a little differently on how it's paid because at the beginning of each year, the landlord's gonna estimate what the costs are and the tenant's gonna pay uh, monthly based on what that estimated costs cost is. And at the end of the year, once the actual costs are known, there's gonna be a reconciliation. And if the tenant overpaid, they're going to get money back from the landlord. And if the tenant underpaid, then they're gonna owe the landlord um, some additional dollars at the end of the year um, for their portion of those operating costs. So if they have like, let's say a five year lease um, and it's a triple net um, and their base rent is $1,000 plus 10% a year, does, does it, and how do you include the separate bucket? Like if it's a five year lease, like every year you write out, well, this is how your, your rent's gonna, very, very based on this. So it'll be set up totally different where you'll have one section of the lease that says your base rent, your monthly amount is X starting year one and will escalate by 10% per year. Then that's in and up by itself. Right. And then operating expenses will be a separate section. It'll define the universe of what those expenses are, what get, can be excluded and how they get paid. So they're treated as totally different like sections within the document. And when, if a landlord is providing statements to a tenant, they're gonna come under like different, like different reporting. Uh, the third item here, percentage rent is a little bit different, but something that you'll see most often in the retail setting. Um, where you might have a tenant paying some base rent, like, like we've been talking about, but it might be lower than your standard office or other tenant will pay because on top of that base rent, um, a restaurant tenant, I'll use as an example, um, is going to pay the landlord a percentage of its gross receipts as they come in the door. So as it makes money, the landlord's gonna get a percentage of that um, throughout the course of the year. Um, and that will, that's what allows the landlord to, to like reduce the amount of the base rent. And especially in the challenging market, like we have now for retail tenants, it's easier for them to get on board with it, right? Because they're only, they're, the amount they pay is going to be tied to the amount that they're making. And so it's less risky um, for them than having a straight base rent situation. Um, some tenants may be paying those operating expenses like a trip on like a tenants would on a triple net basis, like we we're talking about, and sometimes they won't. Um, we see things like a lot of different things these days um, as retail tenants are harder and harder to find and get into space. Any any questions on any of that? Thinking 
Yeah, it's your own thing. Yeah, I'm going to put it in the brain. Yeah, I'm going to put Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. Just real quick, can you re explain the difference between the gross and trick then? Yes. So, the gross lease is going to have those operating expenses um, calculated within the uh, one number, the, the rent that the tenant is paying. And under the triple net lease, they're going to pay two separate amounts a base rent for the privilege of using the space. And a second amount monthly for um, for the operating expenses, their their um, share of the operating expenses that are incurred each year by the land. Like property taxes. Yes, like those pro those property taxes and things. In the under the gross lease situation, the landlord is estimating what the costs are and. If they're right, they get their money back, right? They're still made whole, uh, with, but there's no reconciliation at the end of the year because it's all baked into the just one number that the tenant is paying over the course of a year. Uh, so, you know, leasing, pretty simple. There's two sides and each side has its own set of objectives. And so in terms of what the landlords are trying to do, um, <clears throat> Maximizing rental income, uh, that's a, a pretty pretty obvious, um, pretty obvious one. High quality tenants. Does anybody have a sense of why it matters that the what quality of tenant you have in your space? So both both good answers. Um, good credit is really important because <laughs> you want you want your tenants to keep paying um, their rent uh, throughout the term and hopefully avoid defaulting defaulting them. Um, and you do want trustworthy, um, like just good citizens in in terms of tenants, so that you can be sure that they are. Um, a doing the things they're supposed to do other than paying rent and that you can have a good working relationship with them. Um, another, another factor too is with a high quality tenant, you attract other high quality tenants. Um, you know, in a mall, you're not going to see a Louis Vuitton sitting next to Walmart. And that's the same in office or lab setting, um, people feel, tenants are gonna feel like a building might be sexier because Google is a tenant than, you know, Trisha Greenlee by herself, you know, or Trisha Greenlee poor. So it helps with future leasing to have good quality tenants. The financial stability um, is important uh, and attracting these other tenants. Uh, Long-term leases. You, you want to get tenants in for as long as you can uh, so that you don't have to keep going through the process of marketing space and um, potentially like re-improving space as tenants come in and out. So you're, they're going to try and get tenants to be in their spaces as long as possible um, under under the the leasing structure they put in place at the the front end of the term. Um, 
And landlords are pretty focused on just maintaining property value in general. Um, aside from the obvious, why, why, why is that important? Like what, do you know what that can affect long-term for, for tenants or for landlords? More challenging, definitely, yes, become more challenging. Um, when, when landlords go to um, finance, get financing on their property or go sell, right? The, their buyer or their lender is going to look at their tenant list and be focused on, on these things as well, the tenant credit quality. Um, and so that may affect what they can get in terms of financing, how much they can sell for. Um, and, and so those are important factors. And then limiting liability and risk. So we talked a little bit about that. Um, landlords don't want to have to worry about, you know, loss to themselves, losses to their tenants, being sued by their tenants for anything. So we're generally focused on a, you know, making sure everyone's got insurance in place. That's always going to be a requirement under the lease, right? Because from my perspective as a landlord attorney, um, if there's a loss, if if someone goes in and destroys a tenant's all of tenant's property, uh, we want the tenant to look to their insurance, not to not to us as the landlord. So we require them the, all of the tenants to maintain certain types of insurance for that reason. On the flip side, if one of the tenants decides they hate us as a landlord and burns the building down, uh, we're going to be looking to our insurance to be made whole. Um, but we've got a lot more risk on the tenant side, right? Because they're the ones actually in the building um, operating and, and they're on a daily basis. The presence of a landlord is pretty limited. Should we, um, if we have like a commercial property, should we be asking the tenants for proof of insurance on a year to year basis? Yes. So oftentimes, well, it, Commercial landlords are going to either require the collection of a certificate of insurance at execution of a lease or at the very least before the tenant moves in because we want to make sure they're insured over the course. And then the lease would contain requirements that they deliver updated certificates of insurance um, prior to the, ex the renewal expiration of their existing policy. Um, and the last thing, one item that's not up here, like landlords are going to want to maintain flexibility and control over their own property, right? So if they want to put more buildings on uh, on land that they own, they're not going to want tenants to have rights that might preclude them from building new buildings, remodeling the one they have, and things like that. So that that's an additional objectives that landlords often come in with. Um, so some of these on the flip side, like while the landlord's trying to maximize its income, um, tenants are always trying to get the best deal, right? Um, office tenants have a lot of leverage right now. As you can imagine, because there aren't a lot of people looking for office space, they're getting much better rates than they were in 2019. Um, and so they can find some pretty good deals. They're, they're also going to want to try and control cost, like those operating expenses that we were talking about, um, they're going to try and negotiate with landlords to try and exclude as much of those costs that the landlord incurs every year from what they have to pay or cap them somehow over the course of their lease. Um, this becomes really important in the context of big thing, big items of equipment that will break and becoming and are expensive to replace. So a, an HVAC unit on a building, if that goes out, 
uh, your tenants are going to, if they're triple net tenants, they're going to pay a portion of the cost uh, to replace that HVAC. The cost is high. That might be amortized over the course of their lease. Um, but if a tenant is going into space that they know the HVAC unit is already 15 years old, they may say, landlord, like, we don't want to have any expenses associated with your replacement of this HVAC unit because we know you're going to need to replace it soon. So things like that come up and get negotiated by, by tenants. Um, high quality space. We talked about, you know, for in the office setting, uh, people want to attract employees. They want people to come into the office. So um, the spaces are getting more creative, more light, like more glass and light so that people on the interior can um, have natural light. So they're becoming a lot more accommodating. Um, and so that they're going to want landlords to uh, provide them either dollars so that they can design and construct the spaces that they want to be in or have the landlord build out to the specifications they want um, to achieve those kinds of goals. Um, our firm was in space, in the same space for about 25 years. Two years ago, we moved to like this beautiful, like we have views of all of, of LA and uh, this staircase that connects both of the floors. And, you know, every year we have little law students come in and, and uh, uh, interview with us. Um, it's a, the reactions are really different. Space matters. People will want to go to a, a place it feels good to be in. Um, tenants are going to want to control not just their space, but um, a, their ability to stay in that space um, beyond the original term of a lease. They may want to be able to control other space in the building if they you know, want to, they think their business is going to grow. So they're going to want to try and get as much control over uh, other space, their existing space, uh, as they can throughout the course of a, a term. And they're going to want to do it all with the minimum responsibility. They're not going to want to do much more than maintain the four wall, you know, like four corners of their space. They're um, unless they're in a full building, they generally won't have to be. But they're going to want to make sure that the landlord someone's responsible for keeping up um, the common spaces and the systems that are serving their spaces so that they don't have to worry about like utility shutdowns um, or things, things breaking, going out of date and things like that. Um, and then you know, from a legal perspective, tenants are always gonna look for something called quiet enjoyment which is something that says like means no one can come in and disrupt the tenant's occupancy of their space so long as they're not in default under their lease. You can't go in and kick them out. You can't do anything that would um, interrupt their ability to do their business in the space. And so that's something that tenants are very focused on. Any questions on that? What was that called? The last one? Quiet. Uh, quiet enjoyment. Yeah. So the life cycle of a lease is pretty simple. Um, if you're the landlord, you're going to start by marketing uh, the space. You're going to uh, create relationships with brokers and figure out your economics at the same time tenants are, you know, do, they're, they're put, searching for space within their budgets and things like that. Um, typically at the stage where it's still with the brokers, uh, there's going to be the, the basic terms are going to get negotiated. Is it a triple net lease? Is it a gross lease? How much is the, the base rent that they're paying? Uh, what's the, the, how much parking um, does the tenant get? And all of these things are going to get um, noted in either a letter of intent or a term sheet um, that is used to draft um, the lease document itself. Um, so that next part is the drafting and negotiating of the lease that can take anywhere from on a <laughs> uh, 
simple commercial lease, maybe a month for that process to over a year, depending on um, the size of the space, um, the, the uh, strength of the tenant and things like that. Um, I think that we worked on the Moderna has a building in Cambridge that is their new headquarters. Um, and we did their lease. I think that took about nine months to get done. Um, they wanted you know, a fair amount of control. It was their own building. So, um, And then once that's all done and the lease is signed, uh, the space is going to get prepared one way or another for the tenant's occupancy. That could mean anything from just paint and maybe cleaning up what the you know prior tenant has left in there to um, new brand new improvements, demolishing everything that exists in a space uh, and building it, building something new that fits the specification of your new tenant or building a new building out of the ground. So this can mean a lot of things. Um, then once, once a landlord is in a position to deliver that space, to the, ten the incoming tenant, um, you've got your occupancy, your tenant moves in, um, depending on what their lease says, they're gonna start paying rent, they're gonna start paying those operating expenses, everyone's happy, um, and hopefully you're on autopilot um, by the time you've gotten there, unless um, you have things like defaults um, or, or a bad landlord not, not doing things it's supposed to do to maintain its building. So when a landlord has a property and they hire you as their attorney, you can go to the broker and tell them this is our terms and then they advertise that to potential tenants? No, so good segue. <laughs> um, our role can be different. And so we may get involved that early um, so that we are with, working with the brokers and the owner. Um, no one's gonna ask me what the economic term should be right? Because I don't know that. They're going to give me the basic economic terms. But when it comes to maybe like, what are we giving? What should we give this particular tenant? What does it make sense to give? What's a market, um, a market term to give? Um, or how should we structure if, we, if we're trying to achieve a certain budgetary goal? What are the different ways to structure this transaction for us to get there? Um, so we might be involved at that early stage and then preparing the letters of intent um, and term sheets with the brokers or without the brokers. So, so, so and other times that's all done and baked by the time it gets to me. Um, and, and I'm just going to draft the lease based on it. Um, the preference on, from the attorney is generally to be involved, right? Because no one's really paying attention to the things I really, really care about on the legal side. So we'll see things and have to correct them. And people don't like to see terms change from their term sheet or their letter of intent in, into you know, the lease, um, which, which can happen. Um, so if, if we haven't been involved in the preparation of that proposal, then um, we may review it before it goes to the tenant and be negotiating it back and forth with the tenant um, or not. Um, but once that's baked, we were we are going to prepare the lease document itself and and negotiate it through to completion. And that means working oftentimes not just with, I mean, we work with the brokers, we work with the owners, we work with the asset managers who um, like give us information about the buildings. We're going to sometimes get involved with the construction people if there's going to be construction of some sort because we're going to have to worry about how that's all reflected in the document and that it's reflected properly so that when everybody signs, um, they know what direction to go in, right? And that we don't have any arguments. My, my life it, is, is all about avoiding argument. Um, so preserving the client's interest. I mean, that, that's the biggest key. And then sometimes they're on the tenant side more so than mine, there's gonna be maybe tenants or tenant land, uh, attorneys will be conducting due diligence on the space. Um, anything from, you know, let's make sure that this owner telling us it's their space really owns it. Let's see if there's financing because we might wanna request a, a SNDA uh, from that, that lender to make sure we can stay in the space as a tenant if there's a default by the 
landlord under their their um, loan. So um, that's it. And you can represent both either party, right? Whoever hires you, you can represent the landlord or you can represent a tenant going into their space. Yes. Yes. Yeah, either or not both, right? Probably not, yeah, typically not both at the same time. All right, thanks, Tricia. All right, we're going to go straight through into uh, finance. So give me a second. Slides. All right, so uh, I'm a construction finance guy, so that's what I do. I document um, the financing of construction of large commercial real estate projects. Um, I've done large life sciences campuses, hotels, uh, big office buildings, um, uh, large apartment buildings. Uh, what else have I done? Um, and a lot of industrial. Lately, it's been industrial. That's a huge industrial buildup in this country. And uh, a lot of the financing has been provided by uh, bank lenders. So we're going to uh, start with a question. And you know that I'm going to call on you. So we're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows back now. Um, how do you document a financing tra transaction? Uh, right there, yes. Yes, you. No, 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 no. Any ideas? Okay, we'll go down the row. Uh, maroon shirt. Yes. Term sheet. Good. Excellent. Any other ideas? Anything that goes into a financing transaction? The documents? Checklist. Excellent. And? No idea. All right. Term sheet and checklist. That's great. Usually I get nothing. Okay, term sheet, checklist, diligence, documents, closing. Okay, any idea what goes into financing term sheet? Next row. No idea. No idea. No idea. What about the amount of money that the borrower is going to owe you? How about that? You think? Yes. All right, next. No idea. No idea. Okay. Amount, the loan amount, that's a no-brainer. The term, how long the borrower has to pay the money back. When you do a, a, a residential mortgage or a residential loan, you typically have 30 years to pay the money back. Sometimes you have the 10-year or 15-year for a mortgage loan. Construction financing, the term is usually three years because it takes about a year or a year and a half to build the project. When you, but you give your uh, borrower or the developer enough leeway to get it done in three years, and then you usually have two extension options of one year each. Now, refinancing that property that's just been built, if it's an industrial property or a retail center or a hotel, when you refi, you could have a term on your loan of three years, five years, or 10 years. 10 years is usually the longest that a commercial lender will go on a refi. Extensions, you want to figure out how many extensions your borrower is going to have if you're the lender. Uh, and you can negotiate extensions of the debt if you're the borrower. Fees, you want to figure out how much you need up front, how much you need on the back end for fees. Uh, oftentimes, you can defer interest and just tack it on as a make-hole premium at the end of the loan that gets paid off with the balloon payment at the end. In commercial real estate, financing usually is interest only, and then the principal is due at the end. When you have a mortgage on your house, typically you're paying principal down as you go, okay? So that's very different than having a balloon payment at the end. And the idea with commercial real estate is at the end of your loan, you're going to refinance it and keep refinancing. And the property value is going to keep going up and you'll pull a little bit of money out to improve your property and to get some profit. So fees, interest, when the payments are due, are they due on the first? Are they due on the fifth? Are they due on the 10th? How much interest are you charging? Are you tying it to SOFR? Everybody uses SOFR now. They used to use LIBOR, but LIBOR turned out to be rigged. SOFR is probably rigged, but we use SOFR now anyways, okay? So SOFR plus a spread. 
That's interest and payments, diligence requirements. It's the same diligence requirements basically for PSA or a joint venture. You're going to want to see all the documents that are on title. You're going to want to see all the documents that aren't on title. You're going to want to see all the entitlements if it's a construction project. Uh, you're just basically going to request everything if you're a lender and you're financing a property. And if you're a borrower, you can expect that your lender is going to request everything, including your financial statements, your tax returns, just everything. You're going to have to open up about everything. Confidentiality, there will probably be confidentiality in your term sheet because you don't want, if you're a lender, you don't want your borrower going out and getting a better quote from another lender. Once they sign that term sheet, you want them locked in with you for 90 days, what, however long you're going to keep them, um, and you're going to want everything to be confidential. Um, binding, non-binding, usually term sheets are non-binding, but certain provisions like confidentiality and exclusivity are binding. Deposit, you're going to want a deposit for your due diligence to cover your costs, your opportunity costs. You're tying up your, your employees and looking at this property, so you need a deposit to cover up your costs. And a breakup fee, okay? You can, you can rig your term sheets so it's really hard to get out of by having a high breakup fee, okay? But somebody might not want to enter that term sheet because you're having a high breakup fee. Um, so, you know, usually you end up somewhere in the middle on a breakup Okay, what goes in a checklist and constitutes diligence for a real estate finance transaction? We're now second to last row. We'll start over there. Yes. Any ideas? No. Next. No idea. Nothing to put on the checklist. Next. What about the documents? Maybe a list of documents? Yeah. What what'd you say? Some financial statements? Income statements, good, yeah, that's one thing you could put on there. We got, usually I get nothing, so income statements, good. All right, documents, title, survey, and zoning, org chart, organizational documents. Okay, so you're a person, right? But if you're in the real estate world, you probably formed some LLCs. You might have a trust at the top of your organizational chart, and then underneath that trust, which has the trustees as you and your family members, you probably own a corporation or an LLC or an LP, which then owns other LLCs. So you have an organizational structure with business entities involved. And that's the, and that any lender is going to ask you for a chart of all those business entities showing ownership up to individuals or up to a fund in which investors have invested. Uh, legal opinions, you're going to want legal opinions as to the enforceability of your transaction and the authority to enter into it. Property reports, property level contracts, closing documents, financial information, tax returns, searches, and background checks, right? You got, there are companies that run searches, bankruptcy, uh, litigation, and UCC searches. UCC is the Uniform Commercial Code. And so when you take a security int interest in any property, real property or non-real property, to have a perfected security interest or a security interest that has a, um, a heightened position in line if the borrower files bankruptcy, you have to file a UCC, a, U a Uniform Commercial Code financing statement with the Uniform Commercial Code Office or the Delaware Secretary of State's office where either the state or the county is where you file the UCC, and that will perfect your security interest in the property that if you are a lender, you're taking a security interest in. All right, so that's uh, searches and background checks. What are your finance documents? Any idea, last row, what you would include if you were documenting a loan on commercial real estate? No, no. Nothing? Yes. A loan agreement. Very good. Okay. A loan agreement. You're going to want a promissory note. The promissory note is the promise to pay. You always have to have a promissory note in a financing transaction. You can't roll it into your loan agreement. It's one document that you absolutely must not roll into your loan agreement. Deed of trust. You also want a deed of trust that you're going to record. And when you record a document, anybody in the world can discover it. 
okay, newspapers, whoever they want. Yeah, they can go down to the county recorder's office, pull that deed of trust, and see who has a lien on the property, right? So you don't want all the terms of your deal in your deed of trust because everybody is going to be able to see that. So you keep the terms that you don't want visible to the public in the note or the loan agreement. Then, as Alex said, oftentimes uh, the Blackstones of the world will form single purpose entities, LLCs that only own the property that you're lending against. What happens if the value of that property goes down? Well, they all that's all they have. So you're not getting paid back. So maybe you get a guarantee from somebody that actually has some assets that aren't the property. So an up to your entity, like a fund or an individual or an individual investor, that could be your guarantor. And a carve out guarantee is also called a bad boy guarantee. They're not all bad acts covered in the carve out guarantee or bad boy guarantee, but you would, as the lender, get compensated by somebody who has actual assets if the borrower did bad acts like file bankruptcy, uh, assert that the um, the loan documents are not valid, um, abscond with money, commit fraud, things of that nature. Um, so then other guarantees can include repayment guarantees. That would be called recourse lending if you have a full repayment guarantee from a deep pocket. Uh, completion guarantees if you're in the construction world. You have somebody who has a lot of money saying that they'll complete the project or they'll pay for you to complete the project or they'll agree on liquidated damages uh, for your recovery if the project's not built. Uh, carry guarantee is another guarantee that's used in the construction world. And that gives the lender a deep pocket to cover the costs of, of holding the property while they look for a developer to complete the project. Things like interest, property taxes, uh, uh, covering the day-to-day -day operations of the property. Even on a construction site, you need construction fencing, you need security, you need all kinds of uh, different things. Assignments, you're gonna to wanna to take assignments of all of the documents that cover the, uh, that your owner or your borrower has entered into you on the property. So you can step into those contracts. Environmental indemnity, this is like a guarantee. You usually want a deep pocket guaranteeing that you get paid for any environmental remediation that you get sued for. Uh, joint, so joint ventures, right, we covered with Alex, joint venture agreements, guarantees environmental indemnity and pledge or documents that you can find in joint ventures. And then a sale leaseback is another type of financing. Sale leaseback, instead of a loan, you have a sale and then you have a leaseback where the rent approximates the interest payment. So it's a long-term lease. You sell the property to your lender and then the lender leases it back to you and you pay interest or rent. It's a not well-disguised Financing, sale leaseback. So you have purchase and sale agreement with a deed, a bill of sale, FERPTA, and assignments. You have triple net lease. You have a memo of lease and a ground lease. All right, how do you close a real estate financing? Well, we've established that there's a lot of diligence and a lot of documents in real estate financing. We just closed a, a deal yesterday, and I think it had 1,500 pages of documents. Okay, it's hundred million dollar financing to build an industrial property. Add 1,500 pages of documents. So how do you close them? Uh, the answer is painfully uh, with escrow. So title companies always have an escrow arm. So the escrow arm of the title company will hold funds, produce a settlement statement that tells you who needs to get paid out of this transaction. The lawyers need to get paid. The borrower needs to receive their funds. <coughs> the lender needs to receive their fees. Uh, all of the companies that ran diligence reports and searches and all the various people that helped out in the closing and the diligence process and the broker, the broker is the biggest check there. So if you're looking for a job after this. So Source and uses or settlement statement gets done through escrow. Signing, you need to sign all the documents. Documents that are going to get recorded need to be notarized, right? So you have to notarize anything that's recorded, which requires a notary. So it's not a bad thing to be trained as a notary public. Uh, you're you know, going to be in demand for real estate transactions. And then you need to record documents, whether it's a deed or mortgage or a deed of trust or a lease, whatever it is, it needs recording. All right. 
I think that concludes uh, financing. Any questions about financing? I covered a lot. We've covered a lot of ground with you today. You've got our information. All our information is on the Mayor Brown website. That's where everybody who presented today works. You can email any of us if you have questions about this material. If you're getting into investments on your own and you have questions for us, feel free to reach out. Let us be a resource for you. And I know it's a lot, but it's a crash course on real estate law. And it will give you, if you go back and look at the slides, it'll give you enough to be dangerous in your real estate life. Okay? So, yes. Where is this crash course? In the slides. Oh, in slides. That was what you just said, correct? Right. Okay. Yes. Um, I have a question about, like, the companies like Blackstone and, like, the separate entity, like, LLCs that they might own. Yeah. So, let's say, like, um, they own a separate entity that um, has title to, like, a nursing home. Yeah. And a lawsuit occurs on that nursing home. In that nursing home. Yes. How would... Um, Blackstone, like, prevent tracing to the, the parent company of, like, the separate entity LLC, and how does the person um, proposing the lawsuit, like, go forward? Um, like... Well, if you're going to sue uh, Blackstone LLC, single-purpose LLC that owns a nursing home, then you're going to try to name any name, any Blackstone entity that you can find that's in the equity chain. So you'll do searches, public entity searches, public record searches. You'll try to find who the notice party is on the deed that's recorded showing ownership by uh, Blackstone. And you'll sue everybody up the chain. Now, is everybody up the chain liable? Probably not. Right, that's the whole point of the LLC is it isolates liability at that level, right? So unless they are acting as an agent on behalf of the LLC, they probably isolated themselves from liability. And everybody who's trying to sue is that they, what they're going to get is the nursing home itself, which they wanted to sue. Yeah. Any other questions? They wouldn't be able to sue Black. They would just sue that specific. Oh, no, you can sue anybody. Yeah, you could name everybody. But it's a frivolous lawsuit if you don't have any. And then you could be penalized for filing a frivolous lawsuit if you name people who aren't involved. If you name entities that are involved and you can tie them to the conduct at the nursing home, let's say, then maybe the judge won't throw those entities out. But Blackstone, let's say, as an example, will try to get all of its up to your entities dismissed from the lawsuit and only have the LLC that owns the actual property beyond the lawsuit. That's kind of the point of the single member LLC, single purpose LLC is to isolate liability and isolate a bankruptcy. Because then it files bankruptcy as soon as you sue it for a large amount of money and there's like legal liability. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, do we have a QR code? Yes. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Let's get a Thank you very much. And then I did want to announce to everybody that um, we have had some issues with the attendance on our data side. Um, so everybody is in the system and we're trying to figure it out, but there's like 300 names and we just have to figure it out with the data team. But um, just wanted to let you all know that those issues are being resolved with attendance.